Okay, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of Center for Asian Business at the College of Business Administration of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, generous benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past four years, and also sponsored by the LMU's Department of Asian and Asian American Studies. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, and special lectures and movie screenings. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Connie Chung Jo, who is the CEO of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the voice of for the Asian American community fighting for their civil rights through education, litigation, and public policy advocacy. I had an opportunity to listen to her talk last November when she presented at the annual meeting of Friends of Korea. She's a very thoughtful and inspirational speaker. Our program today is strongly tied to our very timely and important initiative that LMU has been taking, particularly for past two years during the COVID-19 pandemic. That is diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. This acronym, DEI, is at the heart of all social justice work and is intimately linked to the mission and vision of LMU. However, we still have a long way to go to achieve this goal. It becomes more evident if you look at the current challenges facing Asian Americans living in this country. Anti-Asian racism is real. We are deeply saddened by the rise of anti-Asian violence over the past two years. I hope this webinar will help us get to the bottom of this issue and come up with some practical and viable solutions to which we all can contribute to. Before we start this webinar, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration at LMU. She will say a few words to greet you and also share her own as well as LMU's perspective about today's topic. Dr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pack, and uh, welcome everyone. On behalf of the College of Business Administration, the Center for International Business Education and our Center for Asian Business, it's my pleasure to thank the DK Kim Foundation for tonight's contribution to the lecture series and in collaboration with our colleagues over in Bellarmine uh, School of uh, the BCLA, the College of Liberal Arts. Um, we want to officially welcome Connie Chung Jo, the CEO for Asian Americans Advancing Justice. I joined so many of us in this room in solidarity with our Asian friends, colleagues, and communities in ferreting out hate and working together to create a community in harmony. I still recall when I was living in Hong Kong, the joy of embracing differences and experiencing our commonalities across so many different ethnic backgrounds that made us all one global community. Racism in any form must be stamped out in a world that aspires to human flourishing among us all. Tonight's talk on dismantling anti-Asian racism with solidarity calls on all of us for action. As I think about here in the School of Business, we talk about the sustainable development goals and we commit to these in both the College of Business, but also in solidarity with companies, institutions, and communities around the world that are also calling for action. Sustainable Development Goal, SDG number 16, calls for peace and justice and strong institutions. And understanding what we need to do in solidarity is our purpose here at LMU. It is critical as we think about our own mission as a university to be men and women with and for others. In CBA, our college mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community that too provides us with purpose and passion. Both of these missions ask us to act. What does it mean to be with and for others? What does moral courage look like when we observe behaviors that hurt and impact others in deleterious ways? What are we being asked to do? 
So I'm thanking you in advance, Connie, for joining us tonight to help us understand, and more importantly, help us learn how to be with and for others, as well as sharing what moral courage looks like in a society that we hope will embrace anti-racism. But the road to getting to that society starts here, and it starts with us. And with that, I'd like to introduce Professor Park, who will officially introduce our speaker. Dr. Park? All right. Um, thanks, Dale, for your warm, welcoming remarks and sharing LMU's efforts to advance DEI and SDGs. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Edward Park, who will lead the intriguing discussion with our speaker today. Dr. Park is a professor and chair of the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at Loyola Marymount University. He received his PhD in ethnic studies with a disciplinary concentration in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. His current research topics include migration studies, race relations, urban studies, and economic sociology. His most recent publication is on the political formation of Korean Americans, published last year by the Asian American Law Journal at the UC Berkeley Law School. So Dr. Park, thanks for joining us today as a moderator for this special webinar. Now the floor is yours. Would you please introduce our speaker and um, you can start your conversation with her. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beck. Um, it is um, my uh, pleasure to introduce Connie Chung Cho. Um, Connie Chung Cho is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, uh, founded in 1983 as the Asian Pacific American Legal Center. It is one of the foremost civil rights and legal advocacy organizations in the country. Connie Jung Cho is a graduate of USC and Georgetown University Law Center, and she has had a remarkable career in public service, practicing public interest law at the Housing Project Center in Los Angeles and civil rights law, including immigration rights law at the ACLU in Chicago. Prior to becoming the chief executive officer at Advancing Justice LA in 2020, she served as the executive director of the Korean American Family Services for over a decade. I know that you will help me welcome Connie Chung Cho to LMU. With that, I would like to begin our conversation uh, by asking uh, Connie about the work of Asian Americans, uh, of Asian American Advancing Justice LA and, uh, and sort of the portfolio of activities that they undertake. Sure, and thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Park, as well as Dr. Pack and Dean Smith. I'm so um, honored that you've asked me to engage in this conversation with you all. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA, I wanted to ask the audience, if you all wouldn't mind typing into the chat box, whether you're a student or a faculty or an alumni, it helps me just kind of get a sense of who you are since I can't see faces um, and I don't know, I don't know you all as intimately as, um, as Dr. Park and Dr. Pack do. Um, but to answer your question, um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA is the nation's largest legal service and civil rights organization for the Asian Pacific Islander community. And I'll use API for shorthand moving forward. Um, so advancing Asian Americans Advancing Justice LA is um, located in LA and we have an office also in Orange County and a policy director in um, Sacramento. But we, we are part of an affiliation of five independent nonprofit civil rights organizations that use the brand name Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and they use that orange logo you see behind me. Um, but we're all independent, but we all um, share common identity and goals of having an impact in advancing civil rights for our community. So I run the LA affiliate. There is a Chicago affiliate that goes by Chicago. There is an Atlanta affiliate that goes by Atlanta. We have a San Francisco affiliate that goes by Asian Law Center. And then we have a DC affiliate that goes by Asian American Justice Center. So, um, what we do at Advancing Justice LA is a combination of direct services, 
impact litigation and policy work. Um, and uh, we serve over 15,000 clients a year through our direct services that are predominantly uh, legal based like immigration, citizenship, we do domestic violence, uh, family law, um, as well as our health access project. And then we use policy. I think of our direct services as keeping us connected to the community we serve. Um, and we have our Asian helplines to help us connect. But then impact litigation and policy are ways to make systemic changes to address the gaps and barriers for our particular communities. And I like to think of policy as sort of the carrot and the impact litigation as the stick. So that's just a little bit about who we are as an umbrella. All right. Um, can you tell us a, a little bit about how COVID-19 crisis has impacted uh, your work, um, including the rise of anti-Asian hate, uh, the Black Lives Matter, and sort of the general reckoning with race uh, in American society. Yeah, absolutely. And excuse me, I just changed my background because it was driving me crazy how you could see my uh, chair behind me. Um, so when we saw in this pandemic, these two things happening. First, we saw um, the Asian Pacific, the Asian American community being scapegoated for COVID-19, you know, and it didn't help. We had a president and other elected officials who would refer to COVID as the China virus and the Wuhan virus and Kung flu, which essentially put a bullseye on the backs of Asian Americans in this country. Um, and soon thereafter, we saw the murder of George Floyd and a real, um, um, through the Black Lives Matter movement, this public reckoning in our country around systemic racism and anti-Blackness. So both of these movements were, were coming during, uh, during this pandemic. And it was, it really was both, I think, eye-opening to our country as a whole, but it was a real lightning rod, particularly for our Asian American community to say, you know, we, we need to be heard, we need to step up and, un, and be more socially active. You know, I think the last time Asian Americans were activated like this was um, uh, 40 years ago with the murder of Vincent Chin in Detroit, Michigan, who was a Chinese American man who had who was beaten to death by two auto two white auto workers who blamed the Japanese automobile industry for the economic demise that was happening in Detroit at the time. And despite Vincent not being a Japanese uh, foreigner, he was a Chinese. American U.S. citizen, um, you know, he paid the price for that. And um, at that time, the two men who were charged with his murder did, uh, were prosecuted, and they ended up paying a couple thousand dollars in fine and not pay, spending a single day in jail for, for what they had done. And that was, that had been a lightning rod for our API community, right? And that was when our organization was founded the year after that, and we worked very closely with Vincent's mother um, to try to, 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 to gain a justice for her son's death. And that was, for many Asian Americans, that lightning rod moment. Since then, uh, we have been seeing quite as much activism, although there has been from time to time with different things, but this was sort of a wake-up call, what we saw with the rise in anti-Asian hate. Suddenly, people started recognizing that we had been an invisible minority. People didn't care about the Asian American community, didn't think of us as being discriminated against, didn't think we had any problems, which is why people were so surprised when all of a sudden we saw this rise in anti-Asian hate. I can't imagine how many people I talked to who were like, whoa, this all came out of nowhere. I can't believe Asians are being attacked. When in fact, we know this country has a pattern and practice and a history of blaming and scapegoating Asian Americans when we feel threatened as a country, whether by national security or by foreign disease. Um, you know, it's, it's this forever foreigner or perpetual foreigner myth that Asian Americans will never be American enough that we, uh, that we can be trusted. Um, it's why someone like my own father-in-law, who is a US citizen Vietnam War veteran, who was decorated by the US government for his service to this country, um, you know, he was called a racial slur when he was walking down the street in Alhambra, California, because he is of Chinese descent. So, you know, so there's a lot of what we've had to do now is this public education and awareness piece. You know, teaching people that, hey, you know, we've seen 
we've seen Asians be targeted before in this country. We saw it with the Chinese Exclusion Act. We saw it with the Chinatown massacre. We saw it with World War II and the incarceration of over 100,000 Japanese Americans. We saw it with the roundup of um, the Arab Middle Eastern Muslim and South Asians and the Islamophobia after 9-11. And we're seeing it today. So when you kind of recognize that pattern, um, it's easier for us to say, we need to break that. We need to dispel these these uh, false stereotypes about the Asian American community. We need to teach Asian American ethnic studies better at the K through 12 level. And we need to figure out how do we build stronger um, activism that doesn't pit communities of color against each other. Because we know with the model minority myth, one of the things it did is it let Asian Americans, it created a social hierarchy of racism. You know, the, the history of model minority myth is that in the 1960s, there was a professor who wrote an article in the New York Times that said, Asian Americans are the model minority. They're smart, they're hardworking, they excel, they assimilate in this country. But what was underlying that message and what has come from that is that one, it renders our needs invisible when in fact there is a lot, a tremendous diversity in the Asian American community and there's a lot of needs in our community that gets obscured by that stereotype. But the second problem with it is that it, um, underlying that message was, so Asian Americans, you all are doing so well. So what's wrong with you other communities of color, particularly the black community? Why don't you raise yourself up by the bootstraps the way Asian Americans have done? And in doing so, it's pitted our community with black communities and other communities of color. And it's kept us, if we're fighting with, with one another for uh, you know, the scraps that we can get, we're not doing is a bigger problem, a systemic problem that keeps all of us down. So, you know, this is a very long convoluted way of talking about this, this pandemic and what it's done for our Asian American community. And I will say Advancing Justice LA has really focused on a couple things. One is direct services to our API communities because we know a lot of victims come from immigrant families, if they're undocumented, if they're you know women or seniors who are other vulnerable communities, they're not coming forward and they're not asking for help. So we have helplines in six Asian languages and dialects to answer questions and to navigate and provide legal representation. The other things that we're doing is we're advocating for policy changes, you know, to ask, to call for things like uh, Asian American studies at the K through 12 level, to call for more uh, investment by government. So in California, we have the API equity budget that was just passed this year, and it was record breaking because never has California invested this kind of funding into the, into the Asian community, but they invested $165 million this year, this past uh, legislative cycle in response to anti-Asian hate. And then we're doing data collection. We disaggregate data by different ethnic groups because it's important to know that the income levels of the Tongan community is not the same as the South Asian Indi Indian communities or the educational attainment rates for the Cambodian community is different than that of uh, the Japanese American community. And if you understand you know, a lot of the immigration patterns of different groups in this country, you can sort of understand why there's a, such a disparity and diversity in our API um, uh, community. And so these are some of the things that we are doing right now to kind of uh, address some of these challenges. I see, right. Uh, in the title of our presentation is the word solidarity. And in the direct services, the policy changes, the pursuit of the API equity budget, to what extent has coalition building and reaching out to other communities of color or other allies of civil rights and API community, um, how, does, how has that process unfolded? So that's been tremendously important. And I will say one of the silver linings to what has been a really heartbreaking year last year with all of the violence and the deaths and the Atlanta shootings and all of that, uh, I would say one silver lining is finally there's been a public awareness and uh, a, a, around the Asian community and it's, it's made us less invisible. 
And so we've had other communities really wanting to show their support and solidarity. Um, and so for Advancing Justice LA, what we've done is we've taken up every opportunity we can to use this moment to say, okay, let's build solidarity, let's build those connections. So, you know, this year happens to be the 30th anniversary of the LA uprising, which in the Korean community is called Saibu. This is an, that was an important, important moment for both the Black community and the Korean community. Um, I don't think it's taught very well, and so I don't think the young generation who, were, who didn't live through it the way you know I did really know that kind of historical context. But the moment we have now, there's a lot of parallels, right? I mean, we have during this pandemic, we have the Black Lives Matter movement and we've had the Asian rise in anti-Asian hate. And so it's an opportunity to kind of think about where we were then and reflect back then and where we are today. And one of the things we really wanna do is uplift the two communities of the Black and Asian communities here in LA and celebrate celebrate them and highlight them um, because historically America has treated race relations in a pretty simplistic manner and they talk about it in a black, black and white binary, right? That's how it's been framed in the past and what we're really trying to push for is to talk about in technicolor. There are other communities like the Latinx community and the uh, Asian Pacific Islander communities that get excluded when we, when we frame it as a black and white thing. And we need to uplift these other communities and talk about it in a more nuanced way. And, uh, you know, I think what I love about the younger generation, you know, I consider myself, I'm Gen X, but when I look at like the millennials and the Gen Z, what I love about them is they've grown up with a better understanding already about the uh, being more nuanced in this discussion, especially around intersections. So when you look at the intersection of not only race, but gender, uh, gender identity, um, um, sexual orientation, these and how these different groups are, are being oppressed or treated, um, it's a much more nuanced conversation than I know I grew up with. You know, when I started uh, as a civil rights attorney um, back in the early 2000s, it was not this rich discussion that we can have today. So I think there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for solidarity. One of the areas that for me I'm focusing on is, you know, as a woman who has worked in the gender-based violence movement for over a decade, um, you know, I really want to, to, to highlight the, the intersections of race and gender. So, you know, bringing together women of color, social activists and leaders to talk about what does it look like? What, do, what does social activism and civil rights look like when we look at it from our perspective and our lens? And how does it change uh, the way we do business in social activism? Um, and so, you know, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to thinking how do we do a better job also bring the intersection with the LGBTQ community. So there's just, um, I think when we think about solidarity and social activism and where we are moving forward as a movement, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunities and I'm excited by the way we can frame things in a less simplistic way, in a much more detailed, rich way and uh, bring these other movements together. Mm, great, right. Um on that note of your, your personal engagement and your generational background, um, perhaps what we could do is pivot a little bit. And um, Connie, if you could recount your own personal journey uh, for public service, uh, for this kind of um, racial justice activism, what are the crucial and key points of your own personal experiences? You talked a little bit about the LA civil unrest of 1992. Um, so if you could do that for us, I think it would be uh, really empowering for uh, the LMU community, especially sure. for API students who I think find inspiration for their activism in leaders like you. Sure, well, you know, mine's, you know, it's sort of a circuitous, rude, I think. I mean, I, I was in college at USC studying international relations. I majored in, in IR and Spanish and um, had a minor in conflict studies and conflict resolution. You know, I, 
I applied to law school, and this is not a good reason to apply to law school. I applied to law school because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated. And I heard somebody say law school gives you like three years of deferred reality to kind of figure out what you want to do when you grow up. It's an expensive way to kind of figure out how to grow up. But um, I did also know that a law school, a, a legal degree was a pretty ubiquitous tool that I could use in different ways for different types of advocacy. You know, I'd met people who'd gone into policy work, who'd gone and become elected officials, who did uh, practice law, but did different kinds of things once they had a legal degree, a law degree. I knew I was interested in advocacy. I was interested in both international human rights as well as civil rights. And I figured, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I felt like having a law degree would help me advance my ability to focus on that kind of um, civil rights or human rights. Um, I went to uh, Georgetown uh, largely because they had a very strong public interest program and I knew I was never going to work at a private firm or a corporation. I was going to stay in the public sector. Um, and they also had a really good, uh, they had a clinic, a really strong clinic program, they had a strong international law program. And so there were different reasons that um, going to Georgetown appealed to me. I got to say, I love that I was at a Jesuit institution because, you know, Jesuits, they know what it's about when we talk about social activism. Like they, you know, the Jesuits practice what they preach. And so I love that LMU also, you understand that history of social activism coming from being a Jesuit institution that's kind of ingrained, I feel, in, in, the, in the culture of the, of the Jesuits. Um, so I went to Georgetown, and in my third year there, which Georgetown is in D.C., 9-11 um, hit. And I was actually on an interview, on my way to an interview with the State Department when I heard about um, the first of the, the Twin Towers. And, um, you know... After that, Georgetown and DC became a very different place. You know, it was scary. We were all worried, but we suddenly started seeing a crackdown. And what I saw was particularly for some of my friends who were South Asian and Persian, suddenly we couldn't go into bars anymore without the bouncers like asking, you know, threatening to not let them in. You know, we had folks who were who would give them nasty stares. And I just realized how much this um, racial profiling was impacting us, our, our society and our community. And so um, I started looking for jobs specifically in civil rights. I thought, yeah, I could go do other things like international human rights or relief work, but I felt like right now it was important for me to use my law degree for civil rights. And so I purposely went to the ACLU because I wanted to practice impact litigation. And at the time, the Chicago office was working on an interesting post 9-11 case involving um, a, an American US citizen of Pakistani descent who had been strip searched at O'Hare Airport because she wore a hijab, a head covering. And so um, I went there and I got to work on a bunch of different interesting cases. Like you mentioned, I did immigrant rights. I did some police uh, accountability work. I did some, um, uh, some reproductive rights and I got to do some racial and religious profiling work. Um, and after a few years in Chicago, it was too cold. I came to LA. I worked at the Housing Rights Center where I got to do fair housing work. And then after a couple of years there, I said, I'm done with litigation. I'm done with practicing law. I was also done with working at mainstream organizations that I felt did not know how to uh, reach the Asian Pacific Islander community mm -hmm. um, because of not only language barriers, because a lot of the, 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 the folks I worked with did, were bilingual, but really the cultural barriers to penetrate our community. Mainstream organizations were not really able to do that. And so I went to a Korean specific nonprofit and I'm the executive director there. And that's when I was at KFAM for 11 years. Um, and to be honest, I had no plans on leaving KFAM. I loved my job. I loved being in social services, in domestic violence, mental health, child welfare. And I got asked about this job at Advancing Justice LA actually four times. Um, what changed my decision the fourth time where I said I'd be willing to interview and talk to the board and go through the interview process was that the pandemic hit. And, you know, as, as I said, you know, it was the rise in anti-Asian hate and then the, and through the Black Lives Matter movement after the, the murder of George Floyd, where I thought to myself, you know, we are living in a moment of, in history. This no doubt will be a moment that goes in all of the U.S. history books. And our kids and our grandkids are going to study about what we're going through right now. 
And I thought to myself, when my kids and my grandkids come to this chapter and they ask me what it was like to live through it, you know, it felt important to me to be able to say I was part of the solution. So that was what made me, prompted me to kind of change jobs in the middle of a pandemic and um, take on this role at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, because I felt I needed to be in civil rights and social justice um, and be able to say that this is what I was doing in my response to what we're seeing right now in history. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you to all the audience members who are patiently waiting. I have one additional question uh, to Connie and we're going to go to Q&A. And so I would like to uh, ask all the participants once again to use the chat box to ask questions and um, we could have a little dialogue uh, with the audience um, and the presenter. Uh, the last question I have um, is this sort of question of, you, you know, you talked about the very interesting generational shift um, among activists and the younger generation being more comfortable with intersectionality. Um, the sort of the language of systemic racism is now very, very important. Uh, people understand that communities of color are not always united and that there are fissures within these communities along very important sort of lines. Um, when I introduced uh, you, um, I talked about the official you know, jobs that you have, but you also have this other side where you um, advise um, legislative offices and legislators. Um, you're on the advisory of um, you know, institutions like Bank of America where you're dealing with um, you know, linking financial resources to communities of color and, and all of that. So with all that, what is your sort of sense of future of pursuing racial justice work, anti-racism work, uh, DEI work? You know, uh, where are we headed uh, from here? Well, um, I think at one thing I mentioned is it's going to be a much more multicolored, diverse um, uh, movement moving forward. It's gonna be involving black, white, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander, indigenous, different groups, um, making sure we're all included. It's also going to have intersections with other movements like the uh, women and, or gender and LGBTQ. I will also say that some of the other differences I see in the movement as we move forward, one is there is the use of social media and um, online and really that changes things very much where you can do things and have a movement that doesn't require people to be in person and gathering um, in the way they used to. Um, I think the other thing, at least specifically when I think about the rise in anti-Asian hate is there's more sensitivity to how do we build safety, but not at the expense of harming other communities, particularly other communities of color. And um, I mentioned that because um, in, in, when we think about uh, the criminal justice system and incarceration and the, and the focus on that, we've learned through, I think, a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement that more policing and more criminal justice is not always helpful for all of other communities, particularly um, black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted. So when we think about how do we bring safety to our Asian Pacific Islander community, how do we do so in a way that doesn't create harm for other communities? So a lot of what we focus on at Advancing Just as LA is first, framing the narrative that it's not about hate crimes, it's about addressing hate and discrimination. In fact, if you look at the data from groups like Stop AAPI Hate, over 70% of the hate and discrimination that have occurred are things like verbal insults and spitting and racial slurs that are protected First Amendment speech and do not rise to the level of a criminal activity right? That wouldn't lead to any warrant, any sort of arrest. So if we focus too much on, oh, what can the police do to arrest somebody after a hate incident or after hate, you're going to lose out on interventions for the vast majority of hate that happens. The second thing is we want to empower people to think about how can we all build safety for one another? And so what are community-based 
safety intervention. So when folks ask, what can I do in this moment? How can I be an ally specifically? One of the things we do ask is we encourage people to take a bystander intervention training, which we do offer here at Advancing Justice in LA, and I can uh, send a link to folks in case they're interested. It's a free training, but it teaches you tools should you witness an act of anti-Asian hate, what can you do to support that victim, either at that moment or afterwards? Because, you know, when, when, the, when the violence was at its worst last year, you know, after Atlanta and things like that, I spoke to so many many Asian Americans who said, I'm so scared to leave my house. I'm so scared to return to school or go to my job or to get on the subway. I'm more scared about being outside and being attacked because I'm Asian than I am about contracting COVID-19. And remember, this was before the vaccination came out. Mm -hmm. So we had, it's a sobering thought that for Asian Americans, we were more scared of our neighbors and those in our community than we were of a virus that has taken the lives of more than 600,000 people in this country. And so if you want to be an ally, learn how to uh, be supportive and create safe spaces for Asian Americans by both physically, by attending a training so you know how to create safe spaces, by joining things like Neighborhood Watch, but also how to engage in conversations with within your spheres of influence to talk to people and say, you know, I just, I have your back. I'm so sorry about what's happening. I want to be an ally. I want to be supportive. Some of those conversations are easier for some people to do than others. I think folks who are not used to having those conversations, it can be challenging and feel awkward the first time you do it. But it's so important that we break down that divide of saying like, oh, we can't talk about race. We can't, we can't, acknowledge people's race. You know, I think in the past, it was thought that would be racist to talk that way. But now I think there's an understanding, no, being race conscious is actually, uh, to say you're uh, race blind and like not acknowledge somebody's race is actually more problematic than to recognize it and to find ways to show solidarity. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you so much um, for all of your comments. Uh, what I would like to do is now uh, pivot over to Q and A that we uh, that the audience uh, has has posted. The first question comes from Professor Julia Lee uh, from the English department. Um, the comment that you made about uh, sort of like activism um, through social media, um, Professor Lee's question is you know, how do we translate all this sort of um, desire and need to make a difference? Um, and, you know, what is your suggestion on how um, folks in our everyday lives can impact um, politics and policy, um, pursue racial justice work? Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, and I, I I hear that desire from folks who want to do that. And, you know, you don't have to change, quit your job and become, uh, you know, lead a, a civil rights organization in order to have an impact, right? I would say start with your first level would be um, start with your local spheres of influence. Who do you know and who can you connect with to you know, engage in these kinds of conversations to share your message of solidarity. Another thing that everyone can do is get better educated. I think uh, if you don't know about the LA civil unrest, you know, I was just talking to my niece and her boyfriend yesterday because I was just curious, you know, these are, you know, 28 year olds. I asked, you know, what do you know about it? And, and they knew very little. They were, they said, I know there was Rodney King and he was, he was uh, attacked by the police. And so then we had riots. And I was like, there's so much more to that story than that. Learn about the history. Learn if you, um, there's, there's a great documentary, documentary series from PBS called Asian Americans. If you haven't seen it, it's a really, like it's a really good way of getting some overview and history of, of our Asian American community. There's another um, nonprofit called the Asian, Asian American Education Project, and I can put the website uh, address there uh, in a minute. And they, they also have some curriculum as well. But learn about the history of our Asian community. And I would say, let's learn about the history of other communities as well, right? It's not just about Asian American ethnic studies. We need more uh, Black ethnic studies, more, more Latinx, Native American, and uh, 
Um, and so learn that history. In the policy setting, you know, I think it is important to um, to talk to your elected officials. And it, you know, if you feel like, oh, I can't talk to like the my state senator, you can start locally too. I will tell you, before um, Atlanta happened, I was talking to somebody who represented a, an LA City Council member, and she said, you know, I want to talk to you about what we can do around some sort of resolution to stand with the Asian community during this moment. And she said, but my council member needs to be convinced it's important because no one has contacted the council member to say anti-Asian hate is a problem, yeah. right? So if they don't hear from us, it's like out of sight, out of mind. And I think for those of you on, on this, who are participants who are Asian American, um, Culturally speaking, I think there's a lot of Eastern culture values that prevent us from always speaking up. You know, I know there's a Japanese saying that something along the lines of the nail that sticks up gets hammered down, which is the opposite of the saying we have in America, which is the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? We're taught in Western culture, you have to speak up to get what you want. But in certain Asian cultures or Eastern cultures, um, you're taught hey, you know, you, you stay quiet. You don't talk about the bad stuff. You don't air your dirty laundry. I know with my uh, grandparents, that was the mentality. And that's hard with our seniors when we know they were the ones targeted to get them to speak up. And we see that with our immigrants. It's hard to get them to speak up. So if you can encourage folks to report anti-Asian hate, whether it's stop AAPI hate or with advancing justice, because we need to have those numbers. People need to know that this is happening and it's happening still. And um, if you can share when you have local conversations with your school board administrators, with your city council, different groups like that, um, I think it's important to just keep speaking about it. I mean, even if, if those groups aren't comfortable to you, do it, do it on your social media put it on your Instagram, something. Um, you know, we have the 40th anniversary of Vincent Chin's death this year. Um, you know, you have the, the uh, one year anniversary of the death of the Thai senior who was killed in Oakland uh, at the end of this month. You have the uh, one year anniversary of the Atlanta shootings happening in March. There are plenty of opportunities to commemorate and remember these kinds of moments and to, by, talking about it, it, it puts it at the forefront again. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you so much for that. Um, well, uh, two students who know a great deal about Asian American history and Asian American experience um, posed a similar question in the, in the chat box. Uh, Faith Nishimura and Amy Chu is asking the question about US Supreme Court um, taking up affirmative action. Um, and it's going to be a, uh, obviously a, a major uh, decision and a major political event within the API community. If I could bundle Faith and Amy's questions together, what is the best way from your point of view uh, in advocating for and preserving affirmative action? And as API community clearly is divided on this issue, how do we politic our internal divisions within the community as we think about sort of broader historical issues of racial justice and solidarity? Yeah, this is, yeah, we're, um, I gotta say, I'm so worried about the Supreme Court having taken this case because um, we know that the Supreme Court has become much more conservative and it could really uh, threaten affirmative action. Now in California, we have a problem in that California could not pass the proposition to have affirmative action. Uh, you know, we tried last year and um, we, were, we were defeated and one of the most vocal and uh, group and who is funding it the most came from the Asian American community. Um, and so our community is very much split. I mean, there are there are some statistics that show that 70% of Asian Americans, in fact, support a form affirmative action, but the minority who doesn't support it is incredibly active, incredibly vocal, and they work very hard to keep affirmative action from, um, from coming, from happening. Um, so one of the things that I like to do to, to, bring up when it comes to affirmative action and when I'm speaking to Asian Americans who are against it is that first 
when we talk about affirmative action, and certainly in California, when we've tried to pass it, it has an impact not only at the uh, like the college levels and the public universities, it also impacts uh, public jobs within um, the government and the agencies, as well as the way California would bid on small businesses and for vendors for services. What we find is that Asian American small businesses are woefully underrepresented in, uh, in, in um, winning bids with the state of California, as well as our women. So uh, even though people think that um, affirmative action, they only focus in on the higher education side, we know that affirmative that affirmative action benefits many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders when you look at it from a broader picture of things like um, of, of public benefits um, of of government jobs as well as small businesses who can uh, who can uh, win contracts with the government. Um, the other thing about it is, you know, affirmative action. It goes back to this issue of. Um, of the model minority myth and the pitting of our community with other communities of color. So when you look at um, Asian Americans and when you look at, I will say Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders together, which is um, often those two groups are combined into one racial group. And certainly at, Affirm at Advancing Justice LA, we work with both communities as one. You see this huge diversity of needs within our community. Right. We do these reports called Community of Contrast. We did it using the 2010 census and we're working on them for 2020 census. And when you looked at these reports and they had disaggregated data on things like income and educational attainment rates, what we did is we said, OK, census says, you know, this is where the average uh, population is. This is where you break it down by race, like Latino, Black, Asian American, Native Hawaiian. And then we said, now let's break down even further Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders by different ethnic groups. And we charted it all. And what you saw was that when it came to educational rates in places like LA County, well, Cambodians had one of the lowest high school graduation rates and college attainment rates of any ethnic group. Um, it was lower than the black community, the white community, all these other communities, right? And when you looked at income levels, the, the group who had the highest level of being under the poverty line and being low income in LA County was the Tongan community. The Tongan community of LA County, according to the 2010 census data, was 75% um, low income and 49% lived below the poverty line. That was much higher rates uh, than the Latino community, the Black community, um, other communities. It, it, and so it's eye opening when you start to disaggregate the data to see how different communities are, right? Our, our community has the have the biggest uh, disparity between the haves and the have nots. So when we try to push against affirmative action, it, it hurts a lot of our community members. And also, of course, we know that it, it continues to, to create that wedge between us fighting with our other communities of color, which um, you know, we, it's from a, a, a solidarity, we need to be working together, we need to show that diversity is good for all of us, um, which is the messaging that works more strongly, I think, with younger and progressive um, Asian Americans. When it, we come talking to some of the older, sometimes more immigrant Asian Americans and the more conservative Asian Americans, it is a very hard subject. I know it's really hard to talk about this with parents and um, elders, uh, but I think there could be so much more education and activism if we as Asian Americans could do it to try to help um, better educate and build more support within our community for affirmative action. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think what I would like to do is just sort of exercise the moderator's prerogative and combine all the remaining questions into uh, a single question. And um, th so the whole idea here is that, um, you know, if there's a criticism of today's activism, that it is, um, that some people would say that it's performative, meaning that a lot of people sort of take um, tweeting as a form of activism. Um, so 
all of these questions, I think, have to do with this idea of what are the ways, what are the concrete ways in which we could engage sort of different levels of government, all the way from the White House and, you know, soon after the LA civil unrest, we had the White House initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And, you know, that office has had its uh, sort of peaks and valleys. And right now it just seems a little bit missing in action. Um, uh, we could also maybe, you could maybe comment on like what you think are priorities at the state level and then down to what folks could do at the level of Los Angeles and maybe specific um, communities. And so what what is your advice as somebody who, you know, advocated for Asian Pacific Americans uh, in a courtroom all the way to now as a CEO of a, you know, wide ranging um, advocacy organization, you know, how do folks make a difference at different levels of US government in pursuit of this work? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first I wanna uh, talk about what you said that some people um, say that, you know, there, there's, there's performative actions that are done, like just a, you know, a tweet here or there. I want to be careful because I've heard this with some of my younger staff who said there's a concern that they don't want to to send a tweet or put something on Instagram for fear that they will be called out for that reason, that it's performative. Um, I think we don't we should not be tearing each other down. So it is a starting point. If somebody does that tweet maybe it's not enough and maybe you are so much further ahead in your activism than that person and you feel like you wish they would be farther ahead too but when we cut people down at the, when they're at a certain level i don't i think it does more harm than good and i see that a lot i hear that a lot with um some of younger activists who are so passionate but i think we have to be careful to be not so quick to critique and cut each other down but really try to focus on how do we build each other up. Uh, the second thing is, I do think that there are, everyone has a certain level that they can do locally in terms of their activism. You know, at the higher levels, you know, some of the big picture things that we're looking at when it comes to policy is, let's increase the pipeline of Asian Pacific Islanders who are running for elected office. Mm -hmm. I'm worried that the California state legislature doesn't have a single API woman in the state Senate or the state assembly and hasn't had one in six years since Carol Liu. That's a problem. And I don't know who's in the pipeline, or there's a couple of people, but we need more people in the pipeline to be there, because how can we expect somebody to represent our issues if we don't have representation there? So big things like are things like run for office, whether it's at the state level or in your local superintendent or your local city council. Um, but there are smaller things that you can do. If you're, if you're too, you know, you could write, um, you could write to your local um, congressman, a congressman or woman, or your congress member. You could write to your state elected official. You could talk to tell them like you support affirmative action. You can look for when um, issues come up. You could say I support ethnic studies and I want to see it in my school. You can do it in a more local level too. You know, you could say to your local. Um, if you're a parent at a school like I am, you can say to the school, hey, where's your DEI initiatives? What are you doing? How are you adding, you know, in my kids' elementary school, where are the Asian authors in the library? There, you can start baby step if you're not used to it, but if you are ready to go into a bigger role, think about these bigger things like running for elected office, joining different uh, groups that you, might uh, be uh, with, whether it's in corporations or things like that, to make sure that they have API representation and be that, be that leader. There are different opportunities we all have to be leaders and to find gaps, whether it's in schools or our employers or different places where you see that APIs aren't there. And rather than us grumbling about it, which we're really good at, I'm really good at grumbling about them all the time. But put yourself out there and invest in that position or invest the time to make that change and to do that. 
I, I know that's a very kind of vague answer, but I would say the most important thing is to me, um, think about small incremental positive things that you can do step by step to get where you need to be or to make a, a change in the movement. I think sometimes focus people get a little too, um, they kind of think like too big, you know, and think like, oh, well, I can't, I can't run for, um, you know, state office or I, I can't, you know, write a policy brief to the president. So, you know, I'll just delegate for the other people to do. You know, I think policy work is both local as well as state level and national. And at whatever level you're comfortable and you're ready to do, do it. Find what is comfortable, what's the right and appropriate spot for you. And I will say, I think there's a disconnect. When I think about my organization that's, you know, we're 30, 39 years old, um, we have a disconnect between older civil rights institutions and the younger generation of individual leaders and activists. I think the younger generation is used to doing things more individually. Um, you know, when I was younger, it was like, oh, do you have a, are you a card carrying member of the ACLU? Are you part of MALDEF or NAACP? I don't know that folks necessarily gravitate towards those established entities in the same way they did maybe like 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so one of the things that I'm challenged to do is how do I make Advancing Justice LA relevant to a younger generation who's thirsty for activism and connect with you all? And so, you know, part of why I think I have a very rambling and unclear answer here is this is something that our organization is struggling with as well. We're trying to connect with younger activists to figure out what is the best way to connect with you and what is the best way we can collectively mobilize um, for that voice. Voice. And so for anyone who wants to connect with me after this um, um, lecture today, I'm, I'm more than happy to speak to you and I, I'll throw my email address in here in case it's helpful. Great. Thank you so, so very much. Um, I'm sort of reminded of John Lewis's uh, comment of getting into good trouble. And um, I think that was a very empowering message. I think that was a very humble message. Um, I think we need to engage um, individually in just multiple ways. Um, you know, I've been moderating discussions like this at LMU for the past 22 years, and, and I, I dare say that this has been one of the most um, wonderful conversations, enlightening conversations, you know, in, empowering uh, conversations. And so thank you from the moderator and thank you to the audience. What I would like to do is now um, throw the mic to Professor Young Sun Beck for his uh, final words. Okay, thank you so much, Connie and Ed. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I know the audience still have many questions. I have prepared my own question, but I'm going to skip it. Um, Connie already put her um, was it email address and a contact information in the chat box. So I'm sure that she'll be happy to respond to you if you contact her. I just wanna say one thing. I had an opportunity to attend a webinar, how you can build a competence about inclusiveness. And they said it's just the three things. You have to understand who you are yourself and you have to understand the others. And the final step is how to bridge, right? between us and them? Well, it's very simple, but I think that it begins with uh, self-awareness. So um, I always talk to my students that, you know, it is really important that you have to understand the background or the history. Um, so I think that probably has to be a starting point. Uh, we learn about Asian American history and we learn about the history of the you know, black community, Latino community, and, and et cetera. Then I think that they will understand better about the similarities and differences. And we all together to try to bridge the gap or any kind of differences. So thank you so much once again, the Connie, for talking to the LMU community out of your very busy schedule. We really appreciate you sharing with us uh, your insights into this very important issue. Um, as Ed mentioned, your uh, presentation was very enlightening and stimulating. I also like to thank uh, Dr. Park Edward for moderating entering discussion with Connie. 
Finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in April. Please stay safe and healthy until then. When you leave this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a brief survey. I would really appreciate if you could do it. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.